Well friends, let me close the series of lectures on sociology by discussing ethnography in India. This lecture contains history of ethnography in India, something about M. N. Srinivas and his work, a few other names who have contributed to ethnographic research in India, focus of Indian studies and major landmarks, my own works and studies at IIT Kanpur and uh, at the end problems of the field and risk. Now, if you look at the history of ethnography in India, it is started with uh, works of British administrators who studied Indian culture, infrastructure, education, schools, hospitals, religious beliefs etcetera extensively. And then in 1872, some people will say 1871 for the first time population census of India was conducted and uh, decadal censuses subsequently collected lot of anthropological material on Indian communities and their belief system, practices, rituals. Then sociologists and social anthropologists, the major names among them are M. N. Srinivas, then students of G. S. Ghure in Bombay school, D. P. Mukherjee and Radha Kamal Mukherjee of Lucknow school, Iravati Karve, uh, they focused on marriage customs, death ceremonies, omens, evil eye, charms, animal superstitions, sorcery, punishment, slavery, infanticide, sacrifice and dress etcetera. In modern times however, the nature of ethnography has changed and it is no more confined to study of small cultures only. Apart from tribal studies, ethnographers have also taken interest in studies of hospitals and small towns and studies focused on specific issues such as social representations of health and disasters. Some important names would be Vinay Kumar Srivastava and Shailen Divedi and Mamta Mishra. They were my students and Kumar Ravi Priya who is presently working in IIT Kanpur. Now, uh, another important uh, landmark in anthropological studies or ethnographic studies of India was the establishment of the Anthropological Survey of India in 1945, a few years before independence. This Anthropological Survey of India pursued biocultural research among different population groups in the country. Its objectives were more clearly defined in 1985, which committed it to the survey of the human surface of India means study of different communities. Then it conducted ethnographic survey of Indian communities for nearly 7 years between 1985 and 1992 and in all it identified 4635 communities in all states and union territories of India and wrote about them. What did they write? You know, I have uh, a small quote from the report on UP. The report on UP is in three volumes and similar reports have been produced for all the states and union territories. The Parda system among the Ahmadiyas, you know, in this report they are writing about Ahmadiyas, a sect of Muslims. The Parda system among the Ahmadiyas is very strict and women have to avoid various categories of men in their day to day interaction. The women can have some freedom, but within the prescribed 
limits and later it says akika ceremonial shaving of head ceremony is observed and celebrated by a simple feast and an amount is given in charity on this occasion the ahmadiyas bury their dead but do not raise any cover or grave the community believes in simple observation of rituals and simple prayers likewise uh, this uh, uh, report uh, talks about all the communities all the communities they could identify in up and other states and their beliefs customs rituals major practices economic institutions also sometimes political beliefs and so on the most important name in indian ethnography is that of amn srinivas amn srinivas worked in baroda university then delhi university and then ijec bangalore his major contribution lies in stressing the text in stressing the field view rather than the textual view this means that before amn srinivas those who wrote on indian traditions customs practices wrote on the basis of their study of vedas smritis texts of hindu religion and epics and amn srinivas stressed the point that uh, what actually indian communities practice is not the same thing as written in the text and there is a need to make empirical studies of actual practices and beliefs of people amn srinivas himself examined social structure conflict change and impact of development programs he encouraged younger sociologists to do field work this is how from textual view he encouraged people to go for the field view what is actually happening in the field and in diverse uh, local in different settings in different states in union territories in different parts of the country however amn srinivas failed in building a well knit theory of indian society the most important ethnographic works of amn srinivas include the social structure of a masur village which was published in 50s it was in economic weekly and the remembered village which was published from the oxford university press in 1976 amn srinivas made revisit to the same village he called rampura and uh, therefore he studied the processes of the village at two different points of time and uh, compared them so you can say that uh, in a way he started longitudinal studies in eth- ethnographic tradition some other important names uh, in village studies apart from mn srinivas are of b r chauhan who studied ranavato ki sadri in rajasthan mackie marriott who studied kishangadi in near Uh, near delhi p c joshi he was interested in agrarian relations and he looked at uh, village structure from marxist socialist uh, perspective he made a study of two villages of merit in up two villages of itawa one village of almora which is now part of uttarakhand am shahaj uh, study of uh, radhavanas in gujarat is also an important study by ethnographers other studies focused on village society small towns urban slums and minority neighborhoods like uh, in certain parts of delhi uh, somebody studied muslim neighborhood their anxieties their economic institutions beliefs religious practices relationship with government hindu community migration pattern and so on people have also studied different tribes of india some people studied untouchables in particular 
factory as a social organization, trade unions, industrial cooperatives. Uh, an interesting study was made of hospital from which I will make a, a small quote and college students and uh, many more types of studies. The point is that now ethnographers are taking interest uh, not in small cultures only, but they are also studying all aspects of society and social processes. The purpose of these studies was to give access to meaning systems of the diverse people of India. Now, uh, India is such a diverse country that religious, political, economic, social beliefs of North Indians are not same as that of South Indians. Kinship patterns, marriage, rituals, they are all different. It also serves an academic purpose and that academic purpose was rejection of Western models of society and generation of indigenous or own concepts to study Indian society in the Indian setting. The third uh, purpose was to, to have people oriented social science and uh, understand people's approaches rather than experts or managerial approaches to various problems facing Indian society. These studies also help the voluntary development organizations or civil society in advocacy, in social action, in documentation and evaluation of various programs and projects run by them. And lastly a point which is particularly emphasized by psychologists like Ravi Priya is that of healing. Now example uh, of what was learned, uh, I am quoting from Anita Minocha's study of a hospital, see this is what what was learned by ethnographic study of hospital to quote my study of the patients proved to be personally rewarding in more ways than one. Most patients were illiterate and had come to the hospital for the first time. A large number came from nearby slums and villages around Delhi. Their exposure to modern medicine was minimal. They seemed to be ignorant of many aspects of hospital organization, its personnel the placement of people, the status and authority systems and functional differentiation. They found that many of their experiences novel and strange. In a way, the patients and I had a common interest in understanding the hospital and it often turned into cooperation. The patients asking me about the hospital and staff and I posing questions to them on areas of my interest. Having seldom interacted with urbanized, educated and career women, the patients observed the doctors and nurses with interest, taking note of their styles of dress, speech and mannerisms. Needless to say, I was as much an object of curiosity for them as were the doctors and nurses. Given their limited knowledge about doctors and nurses, it was not surprising that they classed me with them addressing me as Dr. G. So, our anthropologist, our ethnographer is studying a hospital is seen as Dr. G by our respondents. Here is a quote from uh, Iravati Karve who made extensive study of kinship patterns in India. The custom of labyrinth by which the widow either lives with or marries the younger brother of her husband is found among the lower caste of Gujarat. Folk tales, proverbs and songs bear ample testimony to this custom though people get angry at such an inquiry. The word bhavi used for elder brother's wife is a respectful term in modern times, but it was not so during medieval times when it was taken as an insulting mode of address for a respectable woman. A story tells that a woman so addressed by a king burnt herself and her curse destroyed the whole line of kings. In the story, the term bhabi is contrasted to the terms bane, sister and ma, mother, which are the proper terms of address by a stranger to an unknown woman. 
So see how uh, the words, their meanings, concepts change with time. In psychology, ethnography has been used in understanding cultural meanings of selfhood, well-being, subjective well-being or wellness or satisfaction or happiness. These days there are lots of study on happiness uh, and uh, uh, there is a feeling that economic development does not necessarily produce happiness. So, let us understand what happiness, what are all the correlates of happiness and Bhutan is one country which in place of uh, developing a human development index develops a concept uh, or index of happiness, index of happiness uh, which includes not only economic variables or education and life expectancy as included in human development index, but also many cultural kinship, family and religious things. Other experiences that may be culturally unique and rendered intelligible only within the specific socio-cultural context means amic concepts. In the last lecture, I was making a distinction between amic and etic. So, this kind of psychological inquiry tells us about amic concepts uh, which are intelligible only within the specific socio-cultural context. And culturally situated understanding of suffering and healing, uh, Ravi Priya particularly gives importance to healing, to expressions of discomfort and it is, it is found that the ethnographic work not only results in uh, knowledge, but it also leads to coping and healing among the informants. So, uh, uh, as, as uh, I mentioned in the last lecture that uh, the product of ethnography depends on researcher also. Uh, Ravi Priya says that there is a dialogic nature of field work which means that understanding people's lives is not only shaped by the kind of mutual relationship developed, but also by the ethnographer's own personal and philosophical theoretical standpoint. N now, I can say that the outcome of ethnographic research depends on three things, reality, whatever is the reality. Uh, last time I said that reality may be seen in a naturalistic framework, it may also be seen in a constructivist framework, but whatever it is, there is a reality. Then researchers relation with the field plus researchers own idea of reality or researchers theory. Thus, research findings are co-constructed by the research participants as well as the researcher. So, unlike the positivistic assumption that research outcomes are objective, value neutral, dispassionate, uh, and, and ethnography would say that the ethnographic outcome is co-constructed. This raises the question how researchers standpoint affected its findings and uh, ethnographers would not shy of accepting the fact that their standpoint affect their findings. So, in the last lecture I said that there are naturalistic ethnographers, there are families, post colonialists, there are uh, constructivists and there are post modernists. Accordingly, their findings of the same social context will differ. Now, among the major landmarks of Indian demography and uh, Indian ethnography, uh, Iravati Karve in 1953. She wrote the book Kinship Organization in India and for the first time she showed that in India there are three major linguistic groups Indo-European or Sanskritic, Dravidian and Mundari organizations of kinship or Austro-Asiatic Bihar, Bengal, uh, Northeast you know, uh, and uh, accordingly there are three different kinship patterns in India. Geographically speaking then uh, she said that there are differences between northern pattern, central pattern, southern pattern and eastern pattern. Among the major landmarks uh, of ethnography in India, M. N. Srinivas I said is an important name and uh, his study of Rampura showed us the way how ethnography must be conducted. So, uh, M. N. Srinivas would be known for methodological contribution and M. N. Srinivas will also be known for certain concepts that he has produced in Indian sociology like Sanskritization, Westernization and cultural 
schizophrenia. You know what is Sanskritization, we have discussed westernization and cultural schizophrenia means that people live in traditional and modern worlds simultaneously. But this is he says to be used in a non pathological sense this uh, uh, living a modern life in office and a traditional life in family does not madness or any conflict uh, any pathology. Uh, this is the reality of Indian process of modernization, westernization. The book he produced uh, based on his four lectures uh, in Berkeley, you know, this is social change in India which was written in 1966. Among other concepts Robert Redfield who was from University of Chicago worked in Madras and in 1956. Uh, he gave the concept of little tradition and great tradition, he studying uh, and writing peasant society and culture. The name of his book is peasant society and culture and the question he was addressing was how does Indian culture survive and what is the relationship between folk culture, peasant culture and the culture of the elite. There is one uh, culture of the elite which is represented by Vedic tradition, Shastras, Smritis, Upanishads, varieties of Hinduism, uh, textual varieties of Hinduism plus epics Ramayana, Mahabharat and uh, 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 contributions made by saints uh, and poets in different parts of the country, interpretations, reinterpretations of epics that is one part. And, uh, 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 people uh, wherever you go in India or even outside people understand the terms of Vedas, Shastras, Smriti that is the textual thing. But simultaneously at the grassroots level in villages and uh, in different tribes there is a different understanding of religion, gods, goddesses, religions, festivals, uh, cultures, rites and uh, there is a continuous and a very close interaction between the folk culture and uh, the elite culture. Folk culture influences and gets influenced by the elite culture and the elite culture influences and gets influenced by the folk culture. So, a small village stone uh, which Emile Durkheim may say uh, a kind of totem in a tribal setting as time passes may become a symbol of goddess Durga or uh, uh, in, in uh, village society in a remote village where some local goddess is worshipped as a goddess of, of a smallpox. Once a smallpox has gone there is no need for such a goddess, but then that goddess acquired the form of Durga. So, this is how folk culture, village culture and textual or all India or elite cultures in India. So, there is a great tradition which refers to elite culture and there, is, there are uh, maybe millions of little traditions in various parts of the country and by interacting with each other uh, they produce a new culture both little tradition and great, great traditions are reformed. Now, among major landmarks slightly away from studies of culture I would like to include a study by Mahmud Mamdani in 1973. You know before that uh, when family planning program was started in India it was the first family planning program anywhere in the world is sponsored by government and uh, Khanna study was conducted by uh, uh, Harvard University, government of India and the Ludhiana Medical College to see the efficacy of contraceptive methods. Some results came and showed that with uh, family planning program birth rate could decline. Now, Mahmud Mamdani conducted an ethnographic study. He worked in a village Manupur, a central village of Khanna study for several months uh, and used anecdotal methods. Uh, he argued that uh, the findings of uh, the Khanna study which was based on survey, a longitudinal study were wrong and actually due to foam tablets, foam, foam tablets were not properly used 
and whatever reduction in growth rate had occurred that was not due to use of foam tablets or family planning methods that was more because of migration. And he argued that success in population control in India will depend on success in providing old age security uh, and change in the pattern of land ownership. According to him poverty is the cause of population growth and the reverse is not true. Today in the field of population and demography there will hardly be any person who, who is not familiar with the ethnographic work of Mahmud Mamdani. Now let me also touch upon a few works that I did uh, after completing my PhD in 1991 State Institute of Health and Family Welfare commissioned a study area specific approach in health and family welfare in which eminent demographers like B.D. Mishra, Asis Bose, Prem Talwar they worked and uh, they made different teams of scholars working in different areas. Since I was placed in sociology in IIT Kanpur, I chose to work among Tharus, a tribal population of Lakhimpur, Khiri and Barais and there I learned several things. Earlier I used to have uh, a feeling that uh, the tribal societies are homogeneous, unstratified, undifferentiated but when I went to Bairaj and Lakhimpur Khiri, I found that uh, Taruj who are less literate and aware, they are divided into three hierarchical groups, Rana, Kathari and Dangora. The hierarchy seems to be related to their degree of assimilation with Hindus. Rana, the higher group, have the same food habits as of Thakurs and Dangoras, the lower group eat all birds and animals. So, purity the concept of purity and pollution would distinguish between high and low. Ranas believe that they are descendants of queens of Maharana Pratap and his military chiefs who were made to flee to forests of this side when attacked by Muslim invaders, Muslim rulers. So, the, uh, this uh, uh, made me uh, more aware of the issue of how India consists, you know, there is one theory that India consists of uh, a large number of tribes and it is the process of Hinduization of tribes that produce a pan Indian Hindu culture. So, uh, in the same tribe among Tharu, some people who could made their life more pure by changing food habits, belief systems, by selective memorialization, by a selective process of historicization you know uh, they become uh, the Kshatriyas or the higher caste and others remain low. Maybe we, as time passes these low people by following the Sanskritization model can also claim a superior position on the caste hierarchy of Hindus. Now, I also found that uh, since their women work in the fields, they substitute breast milk by milk and solids early and therefore, postpartum amenorrhea is low and their fertility level is high. Health centers and health workers hardly serve them. Development has hardly reached them, houses constructed for them are used as cattle shed. The hold of Guruvas uh, is quite strong, Guruvas are traditional healers come leaders and uh, for any program to be implemented effectively, these Guruvas have to be made part of the program. Later on while working in Jabua district in MP, I found the similar stratification among tribes. Although that study was not on population or family planning, that study was devoted to education. But there in Jabua, in rural areas, in tribal areas, I found that the tribes were divided into three categories, the Patelia, the Bhil and the Bhilela. Patelias were at the top and Bhilelas were the most backward. Patelias follow the Pranami sect and consider them to be the descendants of Kshatriyas. Again the same thing. Once your socio-economic condition improves, you want to convert this into cultural gains and you become a Kshatriya of caste hierarchy of Hindus. They are more advanced and all have all the uh, tribes have their own Tadvis, the traditional community leaders, healers, uh, magic men. Uh, there are different names for Tarvis or these people in different parts of the country. 
but uh, the role of leader healer magic man they are all combined into one and uh, for implementation of any program uh, in a tribal context you have to take help of them then at iit kanpur we did lots of studies in which ethnographic method was used uh, studies of women civil liberties and ecological movements studies of development organizations uh, software work in india women faculty in iits and other leading institutions situation analysis of hiv aids uh, for unicef we did this study for unicef and uh, mapping of high risk group in the context of hiv with participation of darbar this was a participatory study and you will agree with me that for researchers like us uh, it's not uh, easy to do field work among high risk groups say sex workers so uh, and then mapping finding out their numbers is spread how many sex workers in which village in which town what kind of practices they indulge in was not easy for uh, scholars and uh, researchers from iit so help was taken from their peer group there is uh, an organization of sex workers in calcutta its known its its name is uh, durbar and uh, 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 we took help of them we trained their sex workers their volunteers and the data were collected from the field with the participation of these volunteers of durbar uh, we also made a study of social representations of health and this study was done in the bondo tribe of odisha uh, we have been using mixed methods so our field work or ethnographic research has been combined with structured interview schedule and uh, qualitative quantitative methods have been combined uh, we find that the qualitative interviews are quite revealing in in the study of women scientists they were quite revealing and they helped in writing an independent paper based on interviews and narratives of women scientists they also provided richer information regarding the various difficulties faced by women scientists which were not known before finalizing the questionnaire so you know uh, some people who do not like questionnaire or who criticize questionnaire research say that questionnaire research uh, yields what the researcher already knows because researcher develops his uh, questions wordings order of questions on the basis of his theoretical understanding of the subject uh, to get something new uh, to get close to reality and to see things from people's perspective qualitative methods are of immense help so uh, for example from questionnaire research you could you could get data on how much time a woman faculty takes in the next promotion but uh, what all difficulties uh, at formal level informal level household level uh, in the socio cultural setting in which they find themselves what kind of dif difficulties women have or uh, what all challenges they face psychological cultural in uh, acquiring resources for research in uh, getting administrative positions uh, in attending seminars and conferences in writing papers you know this could be known only by the qualitative part of research we have also done studies of social movements and one of our students studied pani and disha two organizations of up and uh, we use mixed methods primary data were collected from executive body staff and the target groups means people uh, the researcher participated in staff meetings actual working of voluntary development organizations or these movements was observed at the grassroots level by participating in their meetings programs and workshops data were also collected from key officials panchayat officials school teachers health workers and community leaders there were three phases of data collection that is interesting and that shows the application of qualitative or ethnographic uh, uh, mode of thinking 
first after breaking the ice means after entering the field we collected primary and secondary data using both obtrusive and unobtrusive methods after building an elementary understanding of videos based on literature and above data. Second clarification and verification of secondary data, administration of modified questionnaire, questionnaire original questionnaire was modified on the basis of the primary and secondary data collected in the first phase uh, and then detailed data were collected from project in charges, grassroots workers and uh, observing day to day functioning. After data analysis, then we brought the data to IIT Kanpur and made an analysis of these data and uh, maybe some for some of you it will be a new thing that uh, qualitative research suggests that after analyzing the data and arriving at inferences or findings, it will be a good idea to check uh, your findings with uh, the key informants or the people among whom you work. So, we presented the results before the voluntary development organization Pani and Disha and the people among whom we worked and sought their feedback. On the basis of this, uh, the report was further modified. We also conducted situation analysis of HIV. This was the first situation analysis in India and for UNICEF, we developed the detailed methodology of conducting situation analysis of HIV AIDS. Uh, which included profiling and segmenting the target group. It was actually concentrated on uh, young adults. So, profiling and segmenting of young adults, nature and sources of their vulnerability to HIV, patterns of livelihood, marriage, sexuality, then mapping and scoring vulnerability of blocks, clusters and communities. Uh, blocks are development blocks, clusters are clusters of villages and communities are uh, uh, communities of Hindus, Muslims, tribals uh, and different castes. Castes are also included in communities and then mapping availability of medical services, support mechanism, groups and structures, capacity of available resources, medical practices in the villages and preparedness of schools in undertaking HIV AIDS program. This is not an easy task. Our school teachers and parents are still not ready to accept HIV programs in school education. Now, this required open ended interviews, uh, primary data, FGDs, focus group discussions, uh, collecting data from key informant, knowledgeable persons or gatekeepers, visit to hot spots, uh, the places where truck drivers usually stay, take tea or take food, spend night and also uh, the places where sex workers visit and provide various services to these taxi drivers, truck drivers. And uh, observations and interviews often involving our taxi drivers in search of the target groups. Then we also studied peer groups by participatory approach appearing as the client, sometimes we would appear as the client and uh, this was one way of contacting the high risk groups and secondary data were collected from office record. This shows how mixed method research is used combining ethnography and positivistic approach today. Now, you see in conducting ethnography there are several problems that you face in the field and it is important to talk a little bit about that also. M. N. Srinivas mentioned uh, the following six problems among the major problems that he faced in the field. First is the problem of accommodation, where do you stay? In Rampura, he studied by uh, M. N. Srivas two times. He lived in a cow house of the headman, which he shared with five pairs of plow bullocks and one bullock. In the field, he had lack of facility, there was no electricity, no tap water, no fruits and no vegetables which he used to enjoy in his city life in Delhi. In, uh, then uh, he, uh, he lived with plethora of insects, there was total absence of privacy, any time any informant, any villager could come to your room and discuss things. Uh, villagers are sociable people and curious, you are never left alone, M. N. Srinivas says. Even defecation was a problem in the village setting. 
and lack of bathroom. Uh, sometimes uh, you must be careful that your religious ideas, your light hearted comments may be misinterpreted by your informant. So, be careful. Andre Bete said that you have to be careful that staying in one part of the village, you know Andre Bete on the basis of his study of South India villages, class structure, agrarian relations and so on. He says that studying in one part of the village may not lead to understanding of views of the other, other parts, other factions. I remember in Andre Bete's uh, study that uh, he stayed with Brahmins and uh, the, if you ask a Brahmin what is the population of your village, he will give you the number of Brahmins uh, only, while the village consisted of Brahmins as well as non-Brahmins. But uh, it appears as for Brahmins, uh, the non-Brahmins or the scheduled caste or the untouchables did not exist in their village. So, uh, and, and you have to be careful and you have to meet diverse people. You know, in the last lecture, I talked about theoretical sampling, you have to mix with diverse people in different parts of the village. And uh, Andre Bete also says that uh, bachelor hood uh, of Andre Bete was a problem, a handicap and he recommends that husband and wife teams are likely to be more successful, but this can restrict his free movement and time is spent with the village people. Researcher will have that limitation then. Suspicion regarding what will you do of the information, everybody suspect, everybody wants to know what, what will you do of the data. Now, their uh, ethnographic research has been used in management also. Uh, recently, uh, one of our PhD students made a study of liminal space. Liminal means uncertain, the threshold between the old and the new. Uh, the study focused on, uh, you know, there are spaces in villages uh, which are owned privately but are used publicly, and there are spaces which are owned publicly but used privately. So, they uh, for him, these were liminal spaces, and what is happening to liminal spaces was the subject. Now, there are risks. Uh, I must identify on the basis of my field work and uh, my experiences that. First of all, when you go for the field work, protect yourself uh, without hurting the sentiments of others. Both things are important. If you cannot protect yourself, if you cannot remain safe, healthy for the period uh, you are going to do field work, you must uh, take care of your health and at the same time, you have to maintain a balance between your requirements and what is required to. Uh, to satisfy the sentiments of others. In my PhD field work in Itawa, I had to visit ravines inhabited by dacoit families who told me that even during emergency days, government had not been able to implement family planning in their villages. So, initially there was some hostility, but then I made them understand the purpose of my visit and I said that I am not part of government. Then I had to take frequent uh, tea with goat milk first time. I never took uh, tea with goat milk ever uh, and I did not like it, but to satisfy the sentiments of my informants, uh, my subjects, uh, I had to do this. In Haryana, I study uh, in a study of individual household latrines, I remember I had to drink water which appeared to be dirty as I did not want to hurt the informants. They were drinking that water. Uh, how can I not drink the water which my informants were drinking, uh, when I am not even giving anything to them, I am there only to collect data and observe the processes. Then your organization sponsor should know that you are in the field. In MP in a remote tribal belt, we were geraud by drunken people who, who would make fun of us and sometimes were in a mood to fight. In tribal area, there are some people or some tribe, there are some tribes. Uh, which are always in a state of uh, intoxication. You have to be careful. In Kanpur slum, I remember we were studying fertility in slum. I and my student, uh, we were sitting in a very dirty and stinking area inhabited by the scavenging community of uh, th this slum was created by municipal corporation and was inhabited by the scavenging community. 
and we were attacked and abused by a drunken resident. So, these kinds of uh, things may happen to you when you are in the field and you have to be quite careful. Uh, you must carry medicines as far as possible, uh, maintain hygiene, uh, eat nutritious healthy food as far as possible, but uh, without hurting the sentiments of your people. I remember that in Madhubani district in Bihar when we were doing mapping, we did not find a comfortable hotel. Uh, Madhubani district at that time did not have any decent hotel, government or private. And it was very difficult for a city dweller like us to stay in a private hotel in Bihar, in Madhubani and conduct our study of sex workers and other high risk groups. Uh, we also met uh, two, three times road accidents in Sita Madhi. Uh, however, at the end I would say that field work is a very rewarding experience uh, and in the process of field work or ethnography researcher is as much produced as his findings. Field work has made me more liberal. So, not only we have produced reports for our sponsors, not only we have produced research papers and books and reports, uh, conference papers and material for including in the teaching in classroom, but we are also formed and reformed in the process of research. Let me say that I have become more modest, you may call that I have become a weak person, a weak researcher, but I believe that if you are a true researcher, you will always be modest, you cannot be rigid, you cannot afford to be rigid, because knowledge is about no, is not about absolute truth. I have become much more secular, humanist, working among diverse cultures, people, ethnic groups. Uh, I am today more concerned about human values and I am more sensitive to human suffering. Uh, I have become more of a skeptical researcher, critical of modernist project and develop a somewhat uh, postmodern view of life in academics. And uh, I like uh, to use this term uh, for my self identity, I have become a Buddhist. Now, there are some references, I, for more details you can go through these references, you can read social structure and change by Amen Srinivas, you can read a Rajasthan village by Brijraj Chauhan, kinship organization in India by Ravati Karve and for uh, evaluation of Amen Srinivas's approach, uh, you can read this uh, uh, article uh, Amen Srinivas a village in Karnataka in Amen Srinivas A M Shah and E A Ramaswamy edited book the field worker and the field. Everybody, anybody interested in anthropological research in India must read the field worker and the field. Then uh, religion and society among the courts of South India, uh, Ravi Priya's doctoral thesis to which I referred in the last lecture also and qualitative health research paper of Ravi Priya. This is uh, the reading of these references will help. Thank you very much. <coughs>